Forty years ago this week, the Plain Dealer had a worldwide scoop. The newspaper published shocking photographs of a massacre in a village in South Vietnam called My Lai. This man, Ronald Haberly, brought those photos to the Plain Dealer. He was a combat photographer in Vietnam. Ron, can you tell us how you ended up being in My Lai and taking these shocking photographs that many believe changed the course of the war? Okay, on March 15th, uh, myself and a writer that was accompanied me by the name of Jay Roberts, we were there was supposed to be a hot mission. We were supposed to meet up with a whole battalion, uh, the Viet Cong in the area of uh, My Lai 4. And so I was just kind of like a short time in Vietnam, but I thought, uh, being my last operation, I'll go ahead and volunteer to go on this. So Jay and I were able to go together on this operation. What was the date? The date uh, was March 16, 1968. Okay. In the morning of, uh, early in the morning of March uh, 16, 1968, we were uh, ferried to uh, LZ, an LZ zone where we'd be picked up by the, uh, meet up with the troops and be picked up by the helicopters to uh, ferry us into the village. When we landed, we heard uh, quite a bit of firing going on, but uh, as soon as we got, you know, jumped off, we jumped off the helicopters and we all, every one of us just stuck down in high uh, rice fields. But there was no sound of uh, like outgoing fire. There's a lot of firing going inside the village. We thought it was kind of strange. And so we all stood up, then we started uh, going toward objective. Now, it was early morning. My understanding was the villagers were basically eating breakfast. They hadn't even been to market yet. It was a quiet, peaceful village that you found. It was considered a very uh, Viet Cong stronghold village. But that morning, uh, from my understanding, they were supposed to be dropping leaflets early in the morning telling the villagers to leave. And it was a day that they figured on attacking that the village would be off, all would be, you know, out of the village going to market. And when did the firing start? Firing hit a start, uh, I'd say, probably a little after 7 o'clock, about 7.15 a.m. Who were the first people killed? Uh, the first people who were killed uh, were just, uh, from my understanding, were uh, villagers. You know, women, a few old men, children, babies. And you had two cameras with you, is that right? That's right, I had two cameras with me. One was uh, my own personal camera and the other was uh, the Army's camera. And as a photographer, your instinct was to start shooting what you were seeing. Right, yes, natural. When I started, uh, I did start shooting and uh, basically I shot quite a few, you know, black and white, you know, what was happening, but not showing the actual, you know, killing which did you know, transpire throughout the village. I was trying to do uh, photographs that you could like send home for home down news releases and saying, hey, here's what we accomplished, here's what uh, happened, and here's what we're trying to, you know, trying to do. That type that you know, once they appear in the American newspaper and they have to think, hey, we're doing a you know, great job over there. My own personal camera was uh, just to record my uh, own view of the events that day. So when you started <clears throat> seeing soldiers shooting unarmed villagers, what was your reaction as a photographer? Well, as a photographer, my reaction was to it, should I really be capturing this uh, for, you know, the Army and that? Does this really good, you know, look good as actually what we're, you know, supposed to be doing? You know, you're not search and destroy. You are supposed to search a village and destroy the village, but that doesn't mean in destroy, destroying or shooting at non-combatants. That, that to me was completely wrong. So I eliminated that part with the black, not shooting that happening with the black and white camera that I used for the Army. How about with the color? Color I recorded for my own personal uh, view. Is that would be my own personal record of what happened there that day. And you obviously couldn't intercede, I mean. At, with... Everybody asked me that question. Why don't you intercede, jump up mm -hmm. and down and do something like that? But I mean, you're there at that moment and you really can't rationalize what you can do. You're memorized for a while because mm -hmm. seeing, you know, something like that happening, you know, seeing a little small child shot in that, I mean, just look, I remember Jay Roberts and I just looking at each other and say, hey, there's something wrong here. Yeah. And until we got into the village a little later on, we did realize there was something, you know, tremendously wrong there. And we were going to try to confront, confront Captain Medina to ask him what was really, you know, what's happening here, what's going on. But he was on the radio so much that we decided just go ahead, we'll explore into the village and we'll come back and see him later which we never did see him later on. Did you ever fear that as you were shooting um, these civilians being killed, as you were shooting American soldiers killing the villagers, that you might be in any danger, that someone might have a problem with you recording this 
with your camera. I was amazed during out the day. There's only one uh, little incident that happened when I was in a village, and that's where the photograph of the group of people just huddled together, showing the woman in the front, the woman trying to bu uh, button her blouse. And what happened on that one? I came up on some soldiers guarding these people. And I thought they're just going to question them. You know, Jay Roberts. And I just you know looked at them. Are they going to question them and that stuff? So I thought ah, I'll get a shot of this. So I went ahead. And all of a sudden, one GI I was, hey, look out! There's a guy with a camera. So I thought, uh oh. So. They moved back. I took the photographs of the people. I turned to Jay and I shook my head, figuring they're going to, you know, you know, just question them, interrogate them. All of a sudden, they just opened up on them and they just fell. So you didn't capture the actual moment of the shooting, but because that happened as you turned. Uh, there are s some photographs that I have uh, purposely in the beginning after I after I arrived home and processed and that I realized that there's no way I can really release photographs of showing who the actual persons are doing what mm -hmm. in that. So I figured I'm not going to point the, um, my finger at anyone, you know, soldier. I'm there. I'm part of it. I'm as guilty as anybody else, not for shooting a person, but for not reporting it. And it was just like, you know, one big cover-up, but there are photographs I could have, you know, pinpointed who did what and the actual falling with the, you know, the smoke out of the muzzles and stuff like that. It's just, right. you know, it's just kind of a decision I made myself. And how soon after Me Lai did you return to the United States? I returned to show us about uh, two weeks uh, after Me Lai. My time in the service was just about up for two, you know, two years. I was drafted, and I rotated back to the United States. And you came back, to, back home to Fairview Park? Right, back home to Fairview Park. Mm -hmm. And you started giving slideshows, I understand, too. Well, the whole story behind this, what happened, I arrived home, and I yeah, processed these, uh, the color slides myself. Mm -hmm. And that, and so I kept reviewing them. So I shot a 36 exposure roll on this, and I just kept reviewing, you know, trying in my own mind. I, I thought, what would other people think? So the photographs actually showing the people who was doing what, the actual shooting, you know, those were not presented mm -hmm. to the different groups, the Lions Club, the Kiwanis, and like that. And their reaction was basically like, no, we, we can't do this. No, that's not, this, Americans don't do this. Well, I hate to tell them, but this is, you know, what happened. What gave you the idea that perhaps these photographs might be worth publishing, having published at a newspaper or magazine? Well, what, what happened, <clears throat> uh, the CID, con which is part of the Army Criminal Investigation Division, contacted me because this one gentleman by the name of Andrea Farr knew that everybody in Vietnam had their own camera. So he was uh, maybe one of the... First people that you know that wanted to talk to me, and he asked me the question, "Did you have your own personal camera?" I said, "Yes." Did you shoot photographs of this? I said, "Yes." He was just you know speechless. He says, "When we when we, when we uh, have them," I said, "No. What I'll do is I'll make you copies. Then you can you know have the uh, photographs." So it happened one time. Uh, I think it was the next day we met after I brought all this together, my projector and stuff like this. We put a sheet up on a motel screen. I started you know telling my story. Mm -hmm. And he was just, you know, sitting there amazed. He just couldn't believe it himself. And he asked me the question, you know, did I have any more photographs? I said, no, I answered them honestly, but I never said the words. I destroyed them. Mm -hmm. So that was it. You, so you actually, never said that? I uh -huh. never said that. So what okay. the Army got was some photographs mm -hmm. that really aren't worth something unless somebody talks about them. Like a photograph's right. worth a thousand words. These photographs aren't worth anything unless somebody actually talks about them. And do you think this photographic evidence... Um, eventually helped bring about some changes in attitude toward the war? Oh, it definitely did. I found out from, you know, different military people I've, you know, talked to in the past years that this was a, a very important turning point in the war to help, you know, bring an end to this war. The, these pictures were published November 20th, 1969. About six months later, the Kent State shootings happened. Right. And after that, the tide started to turn, I think. I think that was another eye-opener because more and more... You've, after these photographs were published, there's more and more protests going on. The protests got larger and larger and larger. Mm -hmm. People were just getting, you know, fed up and tired of this war. Well, thank you so much, Ron, oh, you're for welcome. coming in and talking about this. That's it. That's my last interview. Oh. It started with a plane dealer, wow. now it ends with a plane thank dealer. Thank you so much. Oh, you're it's welcome. It's been such no a problem. pleasure.